Okay. Uh, okay. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, uh, which is organized in the context of the ILO or Intercultural Learning Online Project. I am Julia Mori, a research intern at UNU Merit, the United Nations University in Maastricht. And today's guest speaker is Nazrat Sayed, who will talk about uh, Afghan diaspora remittances as a baseline for families and potential contributors to development in Afghanistan. Nazrat is a researcher at the Faculty of Law and School of Business and Economics of Maastricht University, and he's currently working on the external financial governance of EU migration funding. And he was previously involved in various projects at uh, Maastricht University and UNU Merit. Uh, he holds a, a Master's of Science in Public Policy and Human Development with a specialization in uh, Social Protection Policy and uh, Migration Studies from Maastricht University and UNU Merit and a Master's of Science in International Cooperation Policy with a specialization in Development Economics at APU in Japan. And before joining Maastricht University and UNU Merit, Nazrat was working in Afghanistan as a researcher with the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development and Integrity Watch Afghanistan. So um, welcome Nazrat and thank you for joining this webinar. And uh, Nazrat is going to present and then afterwards we will have some time to uh, discuss together and I will open the floor to everyone. So uh, Nazrat, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Julia, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, uh, for participation. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, let me make it uh, full screen. Okay. Thanks. As uh, Julia mentioned, uh, today I will talk about the Afghan diaspora remittances, a lifeline for families and also a potential contribution for the development in Afghanistan. Uh, actually, yeah, this uh, presentation is uh, part of the chapter that uh, I prepared together with my colleague, Dr. Catherine Marchand, uh, for the migration, South Asian Migration Report, uh, which will be published in the first quarter of next year, 2024 by Rutledge. Uh, and also the idea uh, for this uh, uh, topic came to uh, my mind because uh, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, diaspora, uh, Afghan diaspora have contributed a lot. But uh, unfortunately, uh, before the Taliban's recover and also uh, uh, after the Taliban's recover, uh, since uh, 2021 until now, there are negative perceptions about uh, Afghan diaspora. And uh, some people in Afghanistan, they believe that uh, why these Afghans left Afghanistan. So uh, they should uh, have stayed in Afghanistan and they should have uh, taken part in the development of the country. Uh, but uh, uh, we have argued that even these Afghans who have left Afghanistan because of the insecurity, because of the injustices, corruption or whatever reasons, uh, but they uh, have continued uh, their contribution to the development of Afghanistan, even if they are not in Afghanistan. Uh, so, so that's uh, the, the main idea that we have covered uh, in this uh, chapter, and I will talk also about these issues in this seminar. So uh, generally speaking, uh, diaspora communities have been uh, known for their contribution to the development of their host and home countries. But my focus is more uh, on the home country, Afghanistan today. Uh, and, and, and they have contributed through financial and non-financial remittances. Uh, and as we know that uh, due to decades of long uh, war conflict uh, in Afghanistan, uh, there are more than 10 million Afghan diaspora uh, in nearly 100 countries of the world. Uh, so it's not only in Europe, but also even in Africa, there are Afghan diaspora in the Middle East and in, in some other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, for the purpose of this seminar, I will use uh, the term diaspora from the definition of the Danish Refugee Council, uh, not from the IOM, because uh, the Danish Refugee Council, uh, they have also used the term refugees, which makes more sense in the context of uh, uh, Afghan diaspora, because uh, Afghans, they also have refugees or they, they, they are also migrants or refugees in different countries. So that's why I'm using uh, the definition uh, by the Danish Refugee Council for the purpose of this uh, seminar. Um, so 
the over 10 million Afghan diaspora living in different countries, uh, including neighboring uh, Pakistan, Iran, uh, Central Asia, uh, uh, even India, uh, also Europe and uh, America and Canada. So they have contributed uh, financially to Afghanistan, uh, 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 you know, every year. Uh, millions of uh, US dollar. Uh, if you see the data available by the World Bank between 2008 and also 2022, in total, Afghan diaspora, they have financially contributed to more than 6 billion USD. And, and, and the highest amount was uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, uh, and that was unfortunately declined in 2021 because of the takeover of the Taliban. So it was uh, difficult uh, for Afghans to transfer money or uh, to support their families financially in Afghanistan through formal channels. Uh, I mean, such as uh, through money grant, through Western Union or through RIA, different uh, uh, financial companies through which Afghans uh, send uh, money to their families, friends and relatives in Afghanistan. So the figure here, it only captures the, the financial data which were transferred uh, through fa formal channels. And there are also informal channels, which is very difficult to be captured because those uh, or the Afghan who transfer money to their families and, and relatives in Afghanistan informally. And that is called Hawala system. And uh, there's uh, an informal way that one person through their network and, and, and trust from the host country, they transfer the money uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, and also uh, the figure here, it captures only the financial data or remittances to Afghanistan, not to Iran and Pakistan, because there are also many Afghan diaspora from Europe or from Western countries who are supporting their families and relatives in Iran and Pakistan, or even in India and Central Asian countries, such as Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, who are living as a refugee. Uh, and if you look at the bilateral remittances to Afghanistan from the top 10 countries, according to the World Bank data, so uh, Iran, uh, from Iran, like most of the financial remittances transferred to Afghanistan, uh, followed by Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Germany, United States. And one reason that's, uh, that the financial remittances, the highest from Iran by Afghan diaspora is because there are more uh, employment opportunities for Afghan refugees in Iran. And there are many Afghans who go to Iran for as a migrant for working, especially in the sector of construction and, and, and so on, because there are more opportunities for them to work compared to Pakistan or other countries. Uh, but also, uh, as I mentioned before, it's only the, the formal channels that Afghans transfer money to Afghanistan. They are also informal or hawala system that we don't know how much is that money and from which country, because that's very difficult to be tracked or uh, to be followed. And yeah, financial remittances uh, uh, has contributed uh, in Afghanistan at micro and macro levels. At micro level, for example, Afghan diaspora, they send uh, or transfer money to their uh, families, relatives, and even friends in Afghanistan uh, for different purposes. It includes or, or to fulfill their needs. Uh, for example, healthcare, yeah, when they have health issue, so the, uh, the Afghan diaspora from Europe or from the host countries, they transfer money to Afghanistan. And also for the purpose of education expenses, wedding and funeral expenses, construction of houses, vehicle purchase, paying house rent, repaying loans. And even there are also several cases that Afghan diaspora, they support their families or relatives and even friends in, in uh, let's say in Iran and Pakistan uh, to seek uh, uh, onward migration from there. For example, they, 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 they cover the, the migration journey cost of their family members or relatives who want to uh, travel from Iran or Pakistan to Turkey or to Europe or to other countries. Uh, in, in addition to the uh, micro level support by, uh, by Afghan uh, uh, diaspora through their financial remittances, uh, they have also contributed to the GDP of Afghanistan. For example, in 2020, uh, the total uh, remittances to Afghanistan by the Afghan diaspora were 789 million US dollar. And, and that was almost 4% of the Afghanistan's total GDP. But uh, in 2022, that declined to 2.1%, to, uh, yeah, because uh, 
many gram in Western Union, many uh, uh, the financial companies in Afghanistan, they stop uh, uh, their working at the very beginning when the Taliban took over uh, control of Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, so that's why people were using informal uh, channels. But it's also declined now. It doesn't mean that Afghan have uh, stopped sending or have decreased sending financial remittances. It's because many Afghans, they prefer informal channels than formal channels because they uh, want to avoid asking to be asked uh, you know different questions uh, uh, in the host countries that why you are sending money to a country which is not recognized or uh, to a country where the Taliban have uh, control so just to avoid uh, some as uh, asking questions uh, by the host country authorities uh, some Afghans they prefer uh, uh, to use the informal channels uh, but still yeah they, they send money to Afghanistan and even after the takeover of the the, uh, the Afghanistan by the Taliban financial remittances has further increased uh, because there were many families in Afghanistan who uh, lost their jobs uh, and the, uh, you all may know about the economic crisis in the country uh, because of the sanctions uh, uh, on, on the country. Uh, so these are the Afghan diaspora who uh, have taken part in supporting the, their family members or relatives and, and even friends in the country. Not only within Afghanistan, but also some Afghans, they left Afghanistan, they went to neighboring countries such as Iran and Pakistan, but uh, uh, their relatives who are in the host countries in Europe or in other countries such as uh, Gulf countries, America or Canada, they are supporting uh, financially uh, those people in, in Iran and Pakistan. And another uh, component of uh, uh, supporting or taking part in the development of Afghanistan by Afghan diaspora is through non-financial uh, remittances. So non-financial remittances uh, can be divided into three categories. Those remittances by Afghan diaspora organizations and remittances by diaspora return programs by some international organizations and also individually by Afghan diaspora who are not part of the Afghan diaspora organizations and also who have not contributed to the development in Afghanistan or who have not returned through the support of uh, some programs by the international organizations. And then non-financial remittances uh, by Afghan diaspora organizations are mostly in the sectors of health, education, humanitarian or relief uh, support in Afghanistan. So diaspora organizations from different countries, uh, they, they support uh, uh, or they have contributed in the development of Afghanistan and taking part in the health sector. For example, they have built clinics. Uh, or, or also they have built schools or they have, for example, uh, 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 bought materials or equipment for schools uh, or, or for clinics in Afghanistan. And also humanitarian relief support. For example, during the recent earthquake in Herat province of Afghanistan, there were many Afghan diaspora organizations who collected money and they transferred those money. Uh, 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 to different channels to Afghanistan to support uh, the people who are affected uh, by the uh, earthquake. And also when there is flood in Afghanistan or any other uh, issues, so Afghan diaspora organizations, they collect money. Even during the COVID-19, there were different diaspora organizations from the Netherlands, Germany, UK, who Sweden, and many other countries who are uh, uh, providing uh, equipment uh, to Afghanistan. And most of the active diaspora organizations who are engaged in these sectors are from Germany uh, and the United Kingdom as well as the Netherlands. Yeah, the Netherlands has like uh, a, a smaller number of uh, diaspora organizations compared to Germany in UK, but they are mostly engaged or equally engaged uh, in Afghanistan uh, uh, to those EDUs or Afghan diaspora organizations based in Germany in UK. And uh, also uh, diaspora, Afghan diaspora, they have contributed in the development of Afghanistan through return programs by some international organizations. For example, uh, the UNDP uh, has initiated the transfer of knowledge through expatriate nationals in uh, late uh, 2001 in Afghanistan uh, to support uh, the capacity building and administration uh, uh, development in Afghanistan. And also the World Bank started the Afghanistan expatriate program in 2022 uh, with the same purpose as UNDP had as part of Tokten uh, program. And SEM or GIZ, they started um, uh, the return of Afghan diaspora experts in 20, uh, 2010. Sorry, it is not 2020, uh, it is 2010. 
10. It's my mistake. Yeah, they started this uh, program and there were uh, several Afghan diaspora, especially from Germany, who were returning to Afghanistan. And they had really good contribution, again, uh, in the public sector. Uh, uh, at policy level and also at program level and administration level in Afghanistan, they were involved in, in uh, for different uh, years. Uh, some of them, they had contract for two years, some of them for three years. So depending on their contracts, they were involved uh, in, in the development of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and also IUM, IUM like uh, had most of the uh, return programs compared to UNDP, World Bank or GIZ. Uh, uh, IUM return programs uh, started in Afghanistan uh, between 2021 and uh, 2001 and 2021, and around 2,000 Afghan diaspora experts through different IUM return programs were returning to Afghanistan, and they were involved in different uh, uh, ministries or uh, government institutions as well as in the private sector, and that's the difference between the uh, diaspora return programs by IUM and GIZ World Bank in UNDP because UNDP World Bank and GIZ they, they their main focus was mostly within the public sector capacity building in Afghanistan but IUM had also focused on, on public sector as well as the private sector in Afghanistan and some of the projects return uh, uh, diaspora programs projects by IUM uh, or, for example, the return of qualified Afghans from neighboring countries, from Iran especially. There were uh, several Afghan diaspora who returned to Afghanistan and they were working as an advisor or uh, managers in different uh, uh, public institutes in Afghanistan. And also there is another uh, like a very famous program by IUM, which is called Temporary Return of Qualified Nations Project, uh, TRQN, and that was mainly from the Netherlands. Uh, in addition to that, CD4D, uh, one project connecting diaspora for development that was also a part of IUM return program. And C CD41 was focusing not only in Afghanistan, but also in some other countries such as Ethiopia, Somalia, but they were covering Afghanistan as well. And there were Afghan diaspora experts who were returning to Afghanistan and they were working as an advisor and also they were providing training uh, in, in different uh, public and private institutes in Afghanistan. So in addition to the contribution of Afghan diaspora to the development of Afghanistan through Afghan diaspora organizations and also return programs by some international organizations, there are also Afghans who uh, took part in the development of Afghanistan individually. So they, they didn't belong to Afghan diaspora organizations uh, and also they didn't belong to uh, any return programs by the international uh, organizations. Uh, so these individual Afghans, they... Uh, contributed in the development of Afghanistan uh, and they found their way there through their networks uh, uh, in both public and private sectors. For example, uh, Dr. Fazli, uh, he uh, by profession, he is a, 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 a medical doctor and also a specialist in family medicine. He is actually uh, an Afghan based in Sweden, but uh, uh, he was the head of the administrative office of the President Rani in his last position in, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and there were some criticisms as well over him and people were saying why he is a medical doctor and why he's working uh, uh, as a head of the administrative office. He should work uh, uh, in the public health sector because he's a medical doctor. Uh, but he found uh, his way to Afghanistan uh, through his network because his father was a good friend of the former Afghan president, Rani. So through that connection, he found uh, his way to Afghanistan and he left Sweden and he went to Afghanistan and was working there. But also the takeover of the Taliban, he came back to, to Sweden and he's now working as a uh, in his own profession as a family uh, uh, medical doctor. And uh, that was in the in the public sector. But there are several other examples of Afghan diaspora uh, who were taking part or working in the public sector in Afghanistan. Uh, and they didn't uh, return through any uh, uh, return program by international organizations or through EDOAs. Uh, for example, uh, Hamdallah Maheb, who was uh, the senior security advisor to former Afghan president, uh, he had uh, a PhD in computer uh, engineering, but he was uh, a senior security advisor in, in Afghanistan. So there were also criticisms that why he is not working in his field, but why he's working in the in this in the area of security in Afghanistan. 
Uh, and also in the private sector, Ehsan Bayat is one good example uh, because he was uh, an Afghan entrepreneur or an Afghan diaspora based in the US. But uh, uh, when the engagement uh, uh, with the engagement of international community in twenty uh, in two thousand one, Ehsan Bayat also started taking part in the development of Afghanistan in twenty in two thousand two. So uh, he found Afghan Wireless is a telecommunication company for the first time in the history of Afghanistan. So, so that was by an Afghan diaspora. And also later on, he uh, started Ariana Television and Radio Network in 25. And later on, he started the Bayat Foundation in, in, in 2006. Uh, and another good example of uh, Afghan diaspora who contributed in the development of Afghanistan is uh, Saad Mohsini, who is the head of the, the movie group in Afghanistan. And uh, also uh, he started the Tulu uh, TV channel, which is one of the, or I can say the most famous uh, TV channel in Afghanistan. And later on the Tulu News, which is the most famous in Afghanistan. So these were like at individual level that Afghans took part in, in the contribution of Afghanistan. So that's why we argued also in the chapter that uh, Afghan diaspora who have left Afghanistan, uh, they have contributed back to Afghanistan uh, from the host countries through the skills that they have and also through the financial remittances, uh, they were supporting their families and through the skills and knowledge that they have, they have uh, contributed in the uh, development of public and private sector in Afghanistan. Uh, so, yeah, but again, uh, the problem is that there are uh, uh, negative perceptions about Afghan diaspora in Afghanistan. And, and even uh, some of them are called like as a Tommy boys, you know, uh, they are called people who are not honest, uh, uh, you know, for the national interests of Afghanistan. They are criticized. Yes, uh, we can say that not uh, all of them were honest or all of them were pure, not involved in corruption in many other issues, but most of them like uh, uh, they had really contributed uh, in, in the development of Afghanistan. Uh, even those who were criticized uh, by uh, Afghans uh, or, or, you know, who are involved in corruption or many uh, other issues, they have uh, rejected those allegations. And they said we had uh, never involved in these uh, issues and we were very honest and we were working honestly for the development of Afghanistan. Uh, so yeah, that's it. And these are some sources I have added here in the reference part. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nazrat. Thank you for this okay. presentation. Uh, now I will open the floor for anyone who wants to ask something to Nazrat. If you have any questions, please, Matthew. Thanks a lot for that presentation. Um, do you have any um, sort of guesstimate on the extent of informal remittances? Um, I, it's it's very difficult to know how much, but I can say it's uh, it's more than a million. If if you come if you combine all of them, like the informal remittances from Europe, America, Gulf countries, you know, neighboring Iran and Pakistan, so it will yeah. be more than one million. But it's very difficult to to estimate how much because one, there is no sorry, record. One million. I mean, over one million USD. Yeah. Per 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 day per per, hour? Uh, per yeah I can say per month even yeah because at the moment after the takeover of the 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 Taliban yeah so one, it could so be just one million over one million yeah US dollar yeah oh, okay Th and... this is my estimation yeah because it's very difficult but uh, no, yeah, well if... yeah, I agree I ask because the literature here is next to zero I, I mean I've looked and looked and looked I I can't find anything. And the exactly, best yeah. estimates I've come up with are, are 10 times the formal numbers, uh, which would put it in the, the tens of billions. Exactly, uh, yeah. but, but if you combine like in total between 28, but I said per month, not per year. If you combine per year, yeah. certainly that will be a huge amount. Yeah, But the figure I showed, that's per year, not per month. So yeah. that's why per month I said over 1 million. So which if you yeah okay. multiply it, that will be around yeah more than 10 times so that's why it's very difficult to uh, you know to track that because uh, it's uh, informal so there's no record for that uh, but, but if for, uh, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah okay anyone else i do i have a question Please, uh, hi hi nasra thank you so hi. much for your presentation 
I want to mention that I am not at all familiar with the context of Afghanistan. So thank you very much for that um, information. So recently, I think Dr. Siegel shared a paper on LinkedIn about um, how remittances, uh, the receivers of remittances in Latin America are targeted um, for corruption by extortion or bribes. Is that something that uh, uh, Afghanistan people who receive remittances as well uh, have experienced? Uh, no, to the best of my knowledge and based on my network in context as a part of Afghan diaspora, uh, you know, uh, no, there are no issues. Yes, there are issues in Syria as well. Uh, but I haven't heard anything here uh, in the case of Afghanistan about uh, corruption and remittances or financial remittances. No, because it's mainly to the family members, you know. So so that's why, for example, if person A from uh, Germany send money to Afghanistan to his brother or sister or any other relative, so that person, uh, you know, goes to the, the place where person A indicated, you know. Yeah, uh, and, and that person collect the money. So there is nothing uh, possible about corruption. So, yeah. That's so maybe I can just jump in here. Yeah. Sorry, just because I think she's maybe asking a slightly different question because in, in the paper that I wrote with colleagues recently, we looked at whether or not the people who were receiving remittances, mm -hmm. so basically um, started to be targeted for corruption, meaning that rece remittance receiving households were more likely to be asked for bribes, for example. So I think this is more her question, not specifically about corruption in the actual transfer, but whether or not the households that are receiving the money um, might be more likely to be asked for bribes or have to deal somehow in maybe extra corruption than than others. I think that's more the point. <laughs> Uh, I, I, to the best of my my knowledge, I don't know. I, I, I haven't heard anything, uh, you know, that they were asked for a bribe or something. But uh, in, with collective remittances, financial remittances, there are cases of corruption, yes, but not at individual level. For example, Afghan diaspora organizations uh, who were like, collecting money by the name of uh, diaspora organizations they were saying yeah we are supporting those people let's say affected by flood yeah in one part of afghanistan or by earthquake there were some some people saying that yeah they do not like uh, spend all of the money or give uh, the whole amount of the money to the people who are affected so there are some corruption issues you know they keep some of them for themselves or or you know for their own relatives or they for example uh, give the money not to the people who are really in need, but also to some uh, members of their own relatives who are poor, you know, but not like really affected by earthquake or flood. There are cases, yeah, I have heard, but uh, not at individual level here. Any other questions? Yes, Matthew. Yeah, thanks again. Um, maybe two questions. Uh, one, a very general one. Do you have any reflections on the formal and formal distinction? I, I find it increasingly, especially in terms of Hawala, it's all, it's always described as being an informal system, but it seems to me that it's a highly complex, highly sophisticated system, um, and, and it, it maybe does a disservice to Hawala to to just treat it as a, an informal sort of communication among friends and, and family members sort of system. Any thoughts on that? And then I have another one if, if okay. time permits. Uh, yes, Hawala is very sophisticated. I agree with you because uh, like it's very organized way. And as I said, it's through the network, the trust of the person, you know, both here and there. Uh, but it's informal because uh, it's not open to the public authorities through a tax office or departments in the host countries. And also there, uh, there's no control over that money. So people just uh, send the money because if you send the money uh, through formal channel, let's say MoneyGram, yeah, you, you, uh, all the record will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the record will uh, go to the tax department or let's say to the authorities. Yeah? Uh, you can follow as a government official that who has sent the money and when and how much but for the uh, hawala you don't know how much and who and from where so yeah. so that's only that thing yeah. thanks if i could just follow up so, on that um, yeah sorry go ahead because I, I have a follow-up for that too but you go ahead first matthew i, I apologize uh, uh, just a quick one maybe um so one of the paradoxes really of post-war or post august 15th um afghanistan is, is that the taliban seem to be um, uh, pushing, trying to push the Hawaladars to the formal system. 
Well, at the same time, I mean, they've been just as much of the government before them pushing towards a formalization of the system. And yet the Taliban are also the people who are being punished by these sanctions. I mean, all of Afghanistan is being punished by these sanctions, um, uh, which is sort of astounding that it's outside of the news cycle. But that's a, another issue. Um, and so can you say anything about that paradox? I mean, what are the logics here that are, are making the Taliban? You'd think the Taliban would want high, uh, huge numbers of remittances. It just makes life easier for them. Um, and yet they're still pushing uh, Afghans to the, the formal system. Do you have any insights on this? Uh, yes, I, I remember like uh, uh, the former uh, Afghan government, they were always saying better to use the formal uh, channel for transfer because it's for the benefit of Afghanistan as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and also even uh, 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 since the Taliban took over, uh, the Taliban were also like uh, uh, always like uh, I have heard from people that they are saying that, yeah, formal is better. Yeah. But the problem is that people themselves, they don't want to use the formal chain because at the very beginning, it was there were limitation to withdraw money from Afghanistan being so formal was a quite difficult issue. Right. And someone one person was waiting for hours and hours in the queue, you know to have his number to go to the desk and, you know, to ask and there were limitations per week, 100, and then that moved to 200 and then that increased. So that was an issue, but uh, people like diaspora did themselves, not all of them, but uh, yeah, many of them, depending on their situation, you know, uh, they they prefer the, the informal, although informal is expensive. Yeah, for example, if you send, uh, let's say a uh, hundred uh, uh, euro. So the informal cost uh, will be between five to seven uh, euro you have to pay. But if you send 200 through MoneyGram, so the cost will be uh, three euros. So 200, so, so there is a huge difference, but just people to avoid issues, you know, they prefer the, the informal. Yeah. So maybe just to follow up on that, especially on these blurring lines. So, um, in 2001, but I would say especially in 2002 to 2005, when the Taliban was first ousted, I know that the World Bank um, made a big push to try to actually um, sort of regularize a lot of the Hawaladars. So um, Western Union also came in and actually registered a lot of the people who were working as Hawaladars, also as Western Union agents. So this was a way that you already started to see those blurring lines and these kind of very traditional systems also coming into some kind of formal arena. And I know that's also happened in other countries. I don't know what the situation of it is though at the moment. Yeah, so yeah, that's true uh, because uh, many groups started working in Afghanistan and also Western Union, RIA uh, also is working in Afghanistan, but the problem is they are not working in all provinces or they, some, for example, just give you a Western Union uh, is working in one province uh, of uh, out of four in the east of Afghanistan. Yeah, which has like uh, a huge population and very important. So it's not working uh, uh, in all the provinces. This this is also the problem. Some people, for example, uh, they go to other channels and even MoneyGram, Uriya companies, but if also they don't have branches in their provinces or if it is difficult for their family members to go to the main city uh, and withdraw the money, then they prefer, you know, the informal way because uh, that's easier for them because there is no the formal channel. So there are different reasons. And yes, uh, uh, there are, the Hawala is not only in Afghanistan, but also in other countries. For example, in Somalia, I was reading uh, an article that there's also a Hawala system that uh, people were uh, still using that. And uh, yeah, that's expensive, but uh, people depending on their situation, uh, both in the host country and also in the receiving country, they, they choose that. Any other questions? Otherwise, I have a question for you, Nasra. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I was wondering, because you showed us uh, how after the Taliban takeover, um, financial remittances uh, had a really um, relevant decline. And I was wondering about social remittances. So if you have any information about, for example, the ter the return programs that you were mentioning uh, or any other, you know, diaspora organizations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
through international organizations, of course, that's uh, stopped because uh, the Taliban government is not uh, internationally recognized. So international organizations cannot, uh, you know, support uh, Afghan diaspora experts returning to, to the government, which is not recognized. So that's stopped, absolutely. Afghan diaspora organizations, uh, as some of them, they still work in the humanitarian part in Afghanistan. I know, uh, like, uh, I'm uh, part of an Afghan diaspora organization uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, just uh, for the recent earthquake in Herat, we collected money and we transferred uh, to, to Afghanistan to support the victims. And also there are diaspora organizations uh, uh, from the UK. I know that they, they are still supporting people in the sector of health in Afghanistan. And also in the sector of education, they are helping. But for the development projects, they don't. Why? Because they need money from the donors for the development projects. Uh, and also then the donors, they do not work in Afghanistan in the sector of development because of the Taliban government, they are not recognized. But in the humanitarian sector, yes, there are still Afghan diaspora organizations are working. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Matthew, please. I'm sorry, this is my last question. Um, maybe we can talk separately sometime. I, I think it's a fascinating and important topic. Um, could you say something more uh, about the sanctions and how people, um, let's say, perceive responsibility for, for remittances being so drastically curtailed? Um, I mean, is, is blame on the Taliban? Is blame put on Western Union? Is blame put on the sanctioning powers, the US, Canada, in my case, and others? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there are different perceptions. Yeah, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, those who are like uh, in the support of Taliban, they blame the Western countries. Yeah, they, they, they blame the US, but those who are against the Taliban, for example, they blame the Taliban. So so there are different perceptions. Uh, but but overall, yeah, uh, uh, poor Afghans, uh, uh, they are affected badly. Uh, by the by the sanctions, although the US uh, government, uh, they are uh, sending humanitarian uh, money every week to the Central Bank of Afghanistan. Uh, that's why there is a control of the currency in Afghanistan, and even the value of Afghani was improved uh, uh, last month. Uh, so, and, and also there are humanitarian aid uh, programs uh, by the EU. Uh, they are supporting uh, uh, Afghans in Afghanistan and also Afghans in the neighboring countries, Iran and Pakistan, yeah, so there are different yeah uh, perceptions yeah among Afghans. Any other questions? Okay, um, I will send in the chat two um, surveys for you to uh, fill out please. It's like really a couple of minutes. And one is for participants and one is for Nazra in this case. And if you could please, uh, yeah, fill it out. And yeah, if there are no more questions, I would say we can wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and see you next time. Yeah. Thanks bye, so bye. much. Thank Once you. Again. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you.